welcome to the Level Up Show with Edward Permalis, where I will be bringing on experts that have their own level up experiences to share, so you can start to level up both personally and professionally. We'll be digging into their biggest successes and failures that have gotten them where they are today. Let's do this. Here we go. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Level Up Show. Today, my guest is Patrick Beckerton from Cheeky Monkey Media. Uh, He has, for more than a decade, been involved in sales and marketing from managing agency side client strategies to building sales and marketing teams and processes. His experience has given him the opportunity to work with small community organizations all the way to managing fan engagement strategies for NHL and NBA teams. Wow, so that's that's already a lot to digest, but I guess we'll start at the beginning. I uh, checked out your LinkedIn profile, checked out what you've been doing, and saw that uh, you, as just as I did, started your career in sales. So I, I think like, like, like most people that I talk to about this particular question, when you ask them, how did you land in sales? It's usually by accident. So are you one of us? Are, are you one of us or were you, or were you born for it? <laughs> Oh no! I it was it was definitely. I, I I don't know if I'd go so far as to say by accident so much as it was just the um, coming out of uh, out of university with my marketing. Well, actually, even go further. Um, I got an arts degree originally, um, and and that was that qualified me to continue working at Safeway, um, which was great. Um, went back, got my business degree in marketing, and coming out, and it was really you know coming out of school, the the you know right wide eyed wanted to be a marketer um but you know no experience nothing like that it was sales was available and i was like oh i can do that and so yeah accident path of least resistance that's that's definitely how i got started i actually um credit where it's due i when i took my first sales job i spoke with one of my marketing professors from school and just said listen like this is not what I had planned for, and he actually gave me a, a, a pretty good, um, call it a, a, you know, a good pep talk and said, Hey, like, this is how it starts. This is where you start gaining experience and learning stuff. So that, that helped for sure. Yeah. I mean, sales and marketing alignment is a very, very hot topic and something yes. that, uh, uh, something that I find absolutely fascinating. You know, I've, I've spent, I, I spent four and something years at a company where the sales and marketing alignment was an absolute war. It was oh. marketing's job yeah. to get as many leads as possible. And it was our job to keep our conversion rates high while trying yeah. to get to actual sellable leads. So it was completely misaligned. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it, it was a pain, it, it was a pain in the ass for everybody. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, oh, yeah. We may do as we could, right? Uh, one of my favorite questions to always ask people who started their career in sales is, in your first couple of roles, what were the worst sales habits that you picked up? <laughs> oh, oh, man. Well, that's a, it's, a, it's a fun question if for no other reason. Man, that was a long time ago. I think, to, to be honest, when I look back at the start of my sales career, um, it's not so much bad habits I picked up. It was just not knowing what I was doing. You know, really like you, you sort of you go through school and you might take a course or something on sales and you know how to dress, you know how to be on time, you know how to do all the the simple little things. But it was, you know, getting out into the field, working. My, my first job was was working in um, home building supplies and you know working with with contractors and things like that. And you get it on the on sites with, with some of these, you know, these business owners and your expectation coming out of school is that everyone's going to be. You know, everyone's going to dress a certain way. Everyone's going to talk a certain way. All of these things you've read from a textbook are going to work. Um, and that's not how it goes. And I mean, I had I had customers that, would, you know, I show up on site in my nice slacks and, and, and dress shoes and they're walking me through the mud just because like, hey, you know, young buck, we're going to show you what what it's all about. So I would say generally like starting my sales career, the, it wasn't so much bad habits I picked up. It was just not not understanding the game appropriately, I think. And, you know, the other side of that coin is you get so used to, especially when you're young, and, and I think you mentioned even startups, there's that um, there's that desperation to to make a sale, to to try and do 
anything you can do to turn a prospect into a buyer or to keep a, a customer um, that sometimes, you know, especially when you're younger and when you're starting out and when those numbers are, you're so desperate for those numbers, you do things that quite frankly, just don't make sense, right? Like, you know, you give away too much or, you know, you take blame for things that, that quite frankly, you know, you should be taking blame for. Um, but you, you give that up because, you know, again, desperation, desperation is the enemy of any salesperson. And I think that's, you know, looking back in terms of bad habits and things like that, that would, that would certainly be the, the biggest thing. You're always, if you're desperate, you're, you're doing a poor job selling, I think. Yeah. I mean, salespeople in general, we have to be flexible to an extent, but there also needs to be a certain level of assertiveness for a salesperson to be successful yes. and yeah. even for a salesperson to keep the client as a just profitable and as a uh, valuable client. Cause if you're going to let somebody step on your head 24 uh, seven, it's not just you who's suffering. It's, it's account management. It's yep. customer support is the organization as a whole that's suffering because you've made, you, you've made a decision that at that point, especially as a younger person, uh, you know, rent needs to be paid. Ch savings account <laughs> is a concept that you're maybe thinking about five years from now, you know, whatever, whatever aspirations, goals, or needs you have at that point, you need to meet. And, uh, sometimes you end up sacrificing things that are, you know, end up biting you in the ass in the long run. And that's, uh, yeah. that, that's a lesson everybody has to learn from. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, that's totally true. I mean, and, and what's, what's an easier conversation going in front of your sales manager and saying, um, you know, your sales were down, but you brought in $50,000 worth of profit or going in front of a, your sales manager and saying, hey, my sales were through the roof, but they cost so much that I only made $10,000 in profit. Right. <laughs> yep. Uh, and, and, and that cannot, that type of problem, especially with younger salespeople starts at the top. It starts at the sales management. It starts at the training. Yes. As you said, you felt lost at times and, uh, Honestly, you shouldn't have, right? Uh, yep. I, I, it's 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 any sales managers, any sales leaders' job to make sure that not only are you properly trained, but that you also have an open and honest channel of communication between yes. yourself and your leadership. But that's a difficult topic, right? Because yeah. you know, uh, you try being a open and honest person with somebody who is viewing you as a number on a whiteboard. That's, yeah. you know, that's, that's, I love that the current like B2B ecosystem and all that we see as people who participate in places like LinkedIn and social media, see this whole, you know, movement towards a more understanding and ethical uh, business and sales environment in general. But unfortunately, that's, that's only what we see. That's our eco chamber right. of forward thinking people. There's the 95% <laughs> of all the other organizations that are still running something that would be that, 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 that would be more comparable to a scene out of Glen Gary, Glen Ross. <laughs> <laughs> and that, you know, hit it on the head. And I think that's the, the funny thing is even, you know, even in, in, in more progressive sales environments, that's still one of those videos that people, you know, get shows like, Oh, this is a good sales guide. It's like, well, you know, really, it's it's not the '80s anymore. Um, you know, sorry. You, know, you can go, yeah, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, Boiler Room, all of that. It's like, well, you know, okay, maybe it works in you know in that environment, but generally for most businesses, that's not how prospects are going to react. Um, and now I think you know people are just so generally educated prior to even engaging with a salesperson that I, I mean, if you start pulling pulling tricks like that, they're just, I mean, they're just going to hang up the phone and move on, right? There's so many options out there now that. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, part of, uh, part, part of why sales is again, becoming more of a respected and more of a honest profession than it was back in the Glen Gary, Glen Ross days is because the buyer is a million times more important. It's not yeah. just because everybody all of a sudden grew a moral compass. There is, <laughs> there are still, there are still, you know, sharks out there and uh, it's becoming more of a necessity to just be transparent and honest because Mm -hmm. Reputation is everything and reputation is no longer somebody hearing the right thing or the wrong thing from somebody else. Reputation is easy to account for with a Google search. It takes, yep. it takes, it takes two minutes to realize if something is a scam or not, if you know how to Google and most people 
nowadays out of necessity do. <laughs> oh, of course, uh, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I mean, that, that that's a crazy environment right there. And I'm I'm so happy that things are getting a little bit better. I just hope that you know this whole selling without selling out thing just keeps keeps rolling and rolling and rolling. Um, now, when it comes down to when it comes down to career, I you're uh, checking out your checking out your credentials and where you worked at. I know that you started off more as a sales guy and then mm -hmm. s transitioned more into what you studied for, which is marketing, yes. uh, including a very very interesting career jump in and out and back in to Cheeky Monkey V. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, my so Odyssey, as I like to call it. Your Odyssey. Amazing. We'll get to that real quick. But uh, do you feel like do you feel like in, to in, to an extent whenever you've mo whenever you moved into marketing and whenever you started in a sense serving the salespeople of the organization or that you're working at, uh, would you would would you put that as part of your success as a marketing leader as a marketer that you had gone out there and already had to uh, live through the environment of not having a good marketing and sales alignment? I, I 100% doesn't even do it justice. Um, yeah, that's, I think it's key. And, and as you were saying, you know, working in, in industries or in, in different companies, so, so many times you do see that the marketing and sales teams just aren't aligned. Um, and it's, you know, there's, there's all sorts of different things. There's the management from the top down and like saying, you know, market has got to bring in leads, sales got to close them. There's, there's going to be conflict there, but I think even just understanding the process and, and what goes through, you know, sales, the, the, the one thing I always used to laugh at was, you know, somebody coming through and saying, well, you know, how come, how come you couldn't close this deal? It was really easy. You know, I gave you an easy lead. It's like, well, I don't know if there's any such thing as an easy lead. And by the same token, you know, sales guys coming into marketing and saying, you know, why are you giving me such crap leads? You're like, right, what are you talking about? I gave you everything but a silver platter, <laughs> right? Having the knowledge of both sides um, has really let me bridge a lot of that communication gap. And so certainly, you know, in the situations where I've been managing a sales team, just sales team, you know, it, it is coming from from the, the side saying like, OK, listen, like the marketing guys are doing this and this and this for you. Like if, if you're coming with complaints about what they're doing, we can talk about it. But let me tell you the process they've gone through to get this stuff for you. Right. Um, vice versa, working in on marketing teams and you start to hear, oh, well, you know, the sales team's doing this or this or this. And it's like, well, listen, this is these are all the things they're trying to do with the stuff you've given them. Like it's, it's just having that ability to communicate with people and give them really, it's that, that both sides. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's unfortunate because a lot of people tend to, to stick with their silos, you know, sales managers come from salespeople, marketing managers come from marketers and, and they don't get that opportunity really to, to, to cross over. And it's, you know, that there's, there's some organizations and there's certainly some great managers out there that, that manage to make it work. But I, I think it's, it's definitely been a, a huge, huge benefit for me. Yep. That's, that's what I would have guessed. Uh, there's a lot of uncomfortable conversations and a lot of, a lot of the just needless hate that, that can be avoided by explaining this type of process to somebody, uh, especially with sellers, right? Like if, if we had to choose, if we had to really like pick out statistically, I'd say that when it comes to being formally educated, it is usually the marketers that are more formally educated. Yeah. Salespeople come from all types of backgrounds. You'll, you, you'll get the best sales guy in the world who's going to be selling into enterprise and he can, he, he can basically not have a high school degree. Right. Yeah. Well, for marketing, it's a little bit different. You throw somebody into marketing and it's, uh, who, who doesn't know anything. It's, it's, it's not going to be a pretty scenario. Uh, right. un, 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 unless you're Don Draper, maybe, maybe then it goes through, you know, <laughs> yeah. but as, as Aside from that, there's not there's not a lot that you can really do in marketing without either extreme talent or at least some baseline knowledge. While in sales, uh, you know, there's there's a big array of salespeople, and there are very varying levels of and degrees of success. But mm -hmm. if you give somebody a good inbound flow and just let them talk on the phone, uh, even a broken clock will be right twice a day <laughs> oh right and and that's 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 so true and i think one of the the biggest things for for a salesperson is is really that that personality side right um you know having 
having some sort of set of techniques that work is is great. But I think you know people buy from people they like generally, right? Um, if you have the personality, you can get a, you can get a long way with it. Unfortunately, um, with marketing, uh, Google doesn't care how nice a person you are. Google cares about their algorithm, right? You've got to know how to to play with that. Um, the other thing I would I would suggest, and I guess it's for for both sales and marketers, but definitely in marketing. Um, you can come out with all the the school and book knowledge um, in the world. What I've really found, and certainly as you know, uh, as well, we'll get to talk about my Odyssey is um, the experience, the things you learn on the go, the things you pick up, um, just being exposed to different situations. It's 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 kind of amazing, um, especially on the marketing side that I, that I found for sure. Yeah, so you, 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 pretty much in one sentence, you uh, mentioned both book smarts and experience. Uh, if you had to go back, you know, however many years and go back into marketing <laughs> as a completely fresh guy, what would, would you would you would you would you still think that you know pursuing a three to four year degree is exactly what you should do, or would you go straight into somewhere that would accept you in an internship position and just teach you on the job? Like, what what would be your tactic for somebody who wanted to? start going into marketing today that, that's so that's an interesting question i would i would still i would still go through the school because i think you know aside from getting a foundation and some some basics um one of the the biggest lessons i think think students no matter what they're going into the, the things that they certainly learn um going through post-secondary you know it's the time management it's how to how to deal with stress how to you know how to manage multiple different um priorities um those are those are really life lessons and i think you certainly could do that without school i think school forces you into it um in at least a gradual perspective i think if you go into to some professions without that uh, you really get thrown into the deep side pretty quick i think it can be a lot really overwhelming for a lot of people uh, so i think that's important but yeah honestly <clears throat> after school um thinking about the de decisions i've made and even understanding even going back and, and saying okay i had this sales experience to go with my marketing and it's and it's a big key um you know maybe coming out of school if i was really really, really driven to be a marketer, you know, that's where I think you, you take a look at some of those unpaid internships, get a little bit of experience on your belt, get some knowledge, see what other people are doing. Um, Cause it's, it's definitely not what you read on the books. Uh, I mean, it's, you, you can do Google searches all over the the place to, to find out what so-and-so is blogging about and saying is the, the next big thing. But I think until you're actually in there um, on the front lines, doing it, seeing the different strategies that, that come into to play um, it's tough. So that, that, that on on site experience um, is is immeasurable, but I think yeah, the the schooling point gives you a good foundational starting spot. Yeah, uh, I think you know one of the biggest things that schooling gives you also, um, which is a big part of what you mentioned, is just an ability to be organized, at least mm -hmm. a little bit more organized than somebody who hasn't gone through school. Because uh, me, as somebody who's enrolled twice and never stayed for more than a year if i had to look at like my own biggest flaws uh i would say a hundred percent it's that level of organization and the kind of task prioritization which is something that would you know so, so something that would would have definitely helped right mm -hmm. uh and something that i've had to learn in a very very you know because at a certain at a certain point you're just not as your brain is not as flexible anymore i wish i would have learned more of that when i was like 17 18 19 right <laughs> but I think that's interesting though is it, it, it's it's it, the, the brain's not flexible but the, the funny thing is when i look at my first degree my first undergrad um i really wasn't into it didn't on didn't know what i wanted to be when i grew up i'd say i learned some of those lessons i probably learned them the hard way um, but it was my second, my second go round when I did get my business degree. I mean, I was in my mid late twenties at that point, and it just seems, granted, learning new concepts. Maybe my my brain wasn't quite as as strong, but learning the adult concepts, the organization, the time management, I was a little bit more keen on that in my mm. sort of mid to late twenties. I don't know. Maybe it's, it's. I think it's you know it's, it's just. I hate to sound is maybe it's it's a project of or a product of 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 youth and maturity and things like that. You've got to be ready for it. And um certainly I think my first undergrad, um yeah, I'm actually shocked I finished it to to be to be frank. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know, you know, school, school still, you know, school still kind of makes sure that you 
you know, it's not as rough as real life, really. They still kind of push right. you towards getting get, getting there because they have their own agenda too. Like if they have oh, a, totally. if, they, if they have a bunch of people flunking out or, you know, not finishing <laughs> yeah. their degree just because they, you know, had a bit too much to drink on Fridays and Saturdays for the last four years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it, it won't look good. It won't look good. They won't get as many applicants <laughs> next year. So, you know, they have their own agenda too. And they're also understanding that, you know, uh, people in their early to mid twenties aren't exactly the best decision makers most of the time, <laughs> and aren't always the best at um, things like organization. It's just that those are the type of habits that are easier built if they're being built over a long period of time, instead of if you're trying to kind of cramp yeah. them in at some point when you've never done them before. And you're, I think you're absolutely right. It's a more protected environment there for sure <laughs> oh absolutely and uh, especially especially in ivy league is like uh and this is something that you know maybe maybe i've just read the law wrong information but as far as they understand for like ivy league schools the absolute most difficult part is getting in oh, after yeah. that yeah. they're gonna they're they're gonna they're, they're gonna do whatever it takes to make sure mm -hmm. that you uh, you know <laughs> unless you're unless you're really trying to get expelled yeah, yeah. Or, uh, or 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 you're a natural troublemaker as far as like the academic uh the, the the academic part goes they're they're gonna make sure that you know you learn a thing or two and that you actually Absolutely. actually finish so uh i know that we've been teasing the odyssey for the last <laughs> 10 minutes or so so I understand three years at cheeky wonky media uh as vp of marketing and sales Yep. Uh, after that, for a while, you held a couple of different positions. It was Mazu, Vit Vitalis, and then SQM Group, right? Yeah. Uh, Turn it around. So, yeah. Te te tech companies, um, as far as I understand, something also in the sports space with Mazu. Uh, yep. What was... I guess what, what initially prompted you to go out and look for something else? So I, I think originally in, in, I mean, working with Cheeky Monkey was great. It was, um, the company was originally one, a fellow I had worked with at another agency. Um, he had partnered up. Um, they created their own agency. They were, actually, they were trying to recruit me for, for some time. Um, eventually, you know, finally I, I went over and was great and it's, you know, great environment, great people, had a lot of fun. Um, you know, two, three years in there, um, you know, the, the opportunity with, with Mazu came up and it was, you know, I'm a huge sports fan. Um, I'm a huge toy fanatic, all these things. And, you know, looking at their, their, their client list, it was, you know, a lot of sports teams, toy companies, all of this fun stuff. Um, and it was the opportunity to, to work with a tech company. Um, they basically built an app for, for kids and, and, and families, um, but it was an opportunity to just to, to stay within the bounds of my experience on the on the tech side, but now get a chance to work with some of these great organizations, helping them with their you know engaging kids and 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 their parents. The best part about it with working with say the the, the sports teams, um, you know, basically the the key demographic for the app was was basically kids say six to to eleven years old. Um, and it's really interesting because that's the, that's the prime time where you can, you can make a child a fan for life. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and especially if, if that team wins, you know, if you, if you're a fan of a team and that team ends up winning a championship in, in those first year, that's it. You're, you're, you'll never quit. So that was, it was really interesting. It was a lot of fun. Got to tour, um, you know, through, through a lot of great cities throughout, through North America, NHL cities, got to go to games, got to, you know, hang out with their marketing teams and, and figure stuff out and just be just a different, different world. It was, it was quite a lot of fun. Um, but again, you know, startup companies and there are always issues, you know, I think that that's a prime example of say the, the difference between marketing and sales and some of those lines got blurred, um, moved on from there, ended up with Vitalis, which was a, that was a lot of fun um, getting into basically so it's extraction technology, you know, extract um, building these great massive machines that are built to extract botanical oils out of, um, you know, out of, um, you know, different uh, plants and, and things like that. Obviously there, you know, with the, the recreation market opening up in, in, in North America, that was, you know, it was the, the right time at the right place. Got to learn a lot, was managing a department there. Um, I'd say probably learned 
that you know those two two years of Vitalis were were some of the greatest learning experiences of my career because to an extent I kind of I I certainly gone away from the the digital technology side was certainly in, involved in more mechanical technology at this point mm. but then it was really you know managing a department and understanding like obviously my strengths being in the digital side um realizing that you know that's only going to take you so far um, you know with a with a much more diverse marketing mix, um, we we were able to accomplish so much more, and that was a huge huge learning experience for me there. Um, you know, moved on to SQM. I can I can say right now, I you know probably wasn't the the best fit for me. Um, but again, more everything there in in that Odyssey was was really a, a big learning experience. I think when I left Cheeky Monkey the the first time, it was sort of that. <laughs> I mean, I was still in my forties when I left, so I it's not even a, a a thing of youth. It was just you know I felt I knew a lot um, when I left Cheeky Monkey. Um, you know, felt like I could conquer the universe, and it was really interesting to go over those four years and be like, "Holy man, you did like, you didn't know a thing." um to get out and and learn and I take some bumps and bruises along the way um it was really interesting just a huge growth experience for me um but you know as as I was going there you know for four years I actually you know I was questioning myself you know you sort of jump around to, to different gigs and you know you're doing some great things and then you're having you know you're having success on one side you're having some failures on the other um you know, you go through those periods of self doubt. Is you know, am I am I a good marketer? And of course, you have moments and where you go, oh yeah, like I'm I'm a really good marketer. And then you have other moments where you're like, why am I even like, what am I even doing here? Um, Imposter syndrome never leaves. Oh, it's 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 huge. Um, and and you know, and then you almost have to go back and and read your your own resume with a bit more of an objective eye and be like. Okay, yeah, actually, you do deserve to be here. You put in a lot of work and, and effort. And, you know, looking at the, the stuff you've done, you've had some really good success. Like, that's why you were here. Um, and it was actually, just, it was just around that time, um, you know, sort of going, was, I mean, there was there was quite a few or, you know, you had the, those questioning moments, but it was just about that time that Rick, so the, the owner at Cheeky Monkey, he had called me up and um, it was really interesting. I was obviously in a in a very receptive point of view, and I remember going through going through the Odyssey and all the different job interviews. Everyone asked, like, you know, what are you what are you looking for here? And I remember my answer was always the, the same. You know, I'm looking for a place to call home. Like, I want a place where I can learn, grow. Um, when it finally came time, Rick phoned me up, and it was the craziest thing. Um, his first message to me was a was a text message, and it was literally, "Hey." Um, just talking here amongst a group and we think it's time for you to come home. That was literally how he started that, that conversation. I'm like, are you kidding me? Um, so we started talking and it was like, yeah, it was time for me to come home. And it's, you know, back at the cheeky now for, for another two years. And it, it really is. It's, it's, it's been a lot of fun and the ability to bring back what I've, what I learned going out in the world, um, I think is, is helped tremendously. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, uh, that is a very, very heartwarming story. And whenever, yeah, whenever you think about like, 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 th like this is the part of like working with smaller teams, startups, and just let's just say smaller teams in general, because you guys have been around for a while. I wouldn't exactly call it yeah. a startup, right? Uh, the, the thing about working with smaller, more like intimate teams is that the, this sort of, and, and, and this is kind of like a very disgusting word when corporate when corporate like big corporations use it but like a family sort of environment yes. yep. is amazing you know when it's an actual family environment when it's a when it's when it's, when, it's, when, it's, when, it, when it's a soulless corporation trying to claim a family environment that just means all the bad sides of the family where you know you have to build them out of jail every once in a while and you know you go to the you go to the christmas dinner and all you see are your crazy aunts <laughs> that's yeah that, that that's the that's the family environment of a corporation right but for that's but for, exactly for, right but for smaller companies, it's a it's a completely different ball game, and it's 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 all support and it's all love, no matter what happens. And bringing back that level of experience from other verticals is always very very valuable. And on the topic of imposter syndrome, I mean that's one of my favorite topics ever because uh, <laughs> so I I went into sales at like the 
at the right day, a ripe age of 19. So, <laughs> you know, uh, all my friends uh, are either studying or, you yeah. know, they have, they have normal people jobs making normal people money. And, sure. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm, I'm there crushing it at my first sales role. Uh, part of which was like, I wasn't skilled or I wasn't anything like that. It was just that the environment was very, the environment was very pushy and we mm-hmm. had a really good yep. market fit for a while. Like to the point where the product sold itself, it was literally, we were we, at, at one stage before we started growing like serious competitors, which was about a two and a half year period. It was literally the question of, are you going to pay X amount with <laughs> them or are you going to pay X amount minus 30% with us? And right. And and that was it. So it wasn't even selling. It was order taking to a point. Yeah. But it yep. still required a certain level of communication and trust building because uh, because it was the travel industry and it was a messy, messy, messy industry, right? And yep. It required the level of hand holding. It required the level of just uh, it 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 required it required a lot of humanity, right? So mm-hmm. my first story with imposter syndrome, you know, before we started having any competitors, was like I was like, okay, well, this is. Well, this is actually insane. So, you know, I'm going out and I'm telling all my friends, like, we're recruiting like crazy. Let's go. Everybody join us. I I had no idea of what I was actually doing right or wrong. Um, (laughs) I just knew that I was succeeding. And I knew that when I looked at colleagues who weren't, I could find I could find reasons why they weren't. But I would go out and recruit people who I grew up with, who were, you know, very, very similar style stim- s- s- similar style of speaking. And, and imagine this, we're, we're Europeans and we're working with an American, we're working with American yeah. clients. So uh, things like not having a very noticeable accent and just being very, very good at English are, you know, highly valued skills mm-hmm. at a company like that. So I would recruit, I would like get friends in who are, you know, who were at the same uh, who who were at the same level at these things, but they didn't find the same level of success. Uh, and a lot of them quit out of frustration. Uh, and, you know, noticing that, you know, made me think like, oh, so there is actually something proprietary that I'm doing here. I didn't just like discover uh, an infinite money glitch, you know, just press the button right. and it starts coming. Yep. <laughs> and, you know, then we started getting competitors and all of a sudden it's like, was I ever any good? Like, am I good at my job or did I just have a good job? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And, and that, that type of thing, I think, I think it never leaves. Like, like, like one night no. you're going to sleep, like you're king of the world next night, you're, you know, up at 2am thinking, am I even going to have a job when I wake up tomorrow? It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's insane. Right. And I think, I think a part of, I think a big part of, battling that again comes from the top it comes from encouragement it comes from honesty it comes from communication with your managers with your people who are who with the people who are in charge and that type of support is i think as important as trying to teach new skills or trying to improve processes yeah i think yeah certainly from from a management perspective the the best thing you can do and and i've told this to a lot of uh, of people over the years, right? Like my, my role as a manager, um, you know, is, is really to get obstacles out of your way and, and give you the tools you need to do your job the best you can. Um, you know, that's the sort of the approach I take from, from a managerial perspective. And, you know, I've, I've, I've had fun with, with my sales guys saying, you know, the other big part of my job is that, that those, those moments in time when you're standing on a bridge ready to jump, that's where I'm the first call. Cause I'm going to tell you why it's not that bad. Right. Like, um, but I think, yeah, it's, it's so easy. We're always our own worst critics. I think it's easy to, to sort of say like, Hey, things were going so well for me. Now suddenly they've, they've sort of gone, gone to the wayside. I suck. I'm bad at this. Um, I think, you know, management support is key. Having, I don't know if you call it bravery, stupidity, self-confidence, whatever it is to just keep going. Like, you know, there, even in your example, right? Like there's, there was something specifically different that you brought to the table than, than your friends who you thought had the same tools, something in there kept, you know, was, was a difference maker that you had. Um, I've had like going through even, even my own questions and, 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 and worries about it was, it'd be interesting sitting down and, and talking with other friends who, you know, they own their businesses and they're asking about, Oh, what should I do for this? What should I do for this? And I'm rolling ideas off the back of my, my hand, just stuff that to me seems so much common sense. And my friends would be looking at me like I was, 
I was giving them voodoo. Like, oh my God, that's so ingenious. You're like, okay, well, this is what I do all the time, right? It's it's interesting little things like that. Um, I think sometimes good management is is key. And uh, sometimes just not being your own worst critic can be a, a, a huge help too. <laughs> Yeah, we te- we tend to value outside information a lot more than the information that's oh. inside of us because the information that we have and the things that we work with are self-explanatory to us. They're normal. They're things that we know. It is not the rest of the 99% of the universe that we have not Correct. explored. It is that 1% that makes a lot of sense to us that we think is just, you know, common sense at that point. But you know, that's that, that's also just a big reason why people undervalue themselves in the business environment. And the, the the last thing you can do as a sales guy as as, as a salesperson in general is undervalue yourself or your product or your knowledge because oh, yeah. yeah. uh, you know if like like you, even though even though we're trying to move away from that I still think that you know in sales there's you're, you're always going to have to be the one who's uh, you know the one who's uh, playing your own drum the loudest because yes. Because nobody else is gonna, nobody else is gonna go after it. Like nobody else is gonna do it if it's not gonna be you. What's the the one you never be afraid to toot your own horn because you're the only one who knows the tune. Yeah. Right. Um, so agree. So agree. And I think yeah, for for salespeople having that that internal confidence, right? And that's a big thing. Even I look for when when I'm when I'm hiring. You know, is this is this person like they're going to be tough times in a sales career you can't you can't avoid it you're going to have tough times who's got the the, the strength the fortitude who's crazy enough to just keep going yep right and uh, most of the time you know people 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 don't people don't stay stay in that position <laughs> for too long i mean uh you know sales people don't have the longest uh, longest longest career paths in general i think uh once you get past a certain point once you've mm-hmm. proven to yourself at least in one role that you can do it great but i think like the average new recruit like lasts like months right it's 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 not yeah. it's not a role where you're staying in, in years people either people either love it or hate it and the people who love it still hate it half the time <laughs> <laughs> just half uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, 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 it depends on your territory right <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so true yeah 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 well listen uh patrick it's been awesome hosting you where can people find more of you? Where should people look for what you're doing? Yeah, so we're so Cheeky Monkey Media. So we're we're web development and digital marketing and and all that fun stuff. So if uh, if if you're looking for the web developers, that's uh, that's a team that's a team within my team. But uh, if you if you want to speak more with me, it's really on the digital marketing and SEO side where I get to have some fun and get, get to stick my hands in, even though I'm the technically the the boss. I get to. To, to get active with there. So we're at uh, cheekymonkeymedia.ca. Um, so dot, um, that's, uh, that's, that's where you'll find us. And of course I'm available on LinkedIn and, and all that other fun stuff. I'm always happy to, to chat. And um, certainly, uh, like I said, I, I don't get to talk about myself enough. So if, you know, if you have questions for me, I'm always happy to answer. And, and if you've got questions just about marketing or sales in general, again, it's, you know, what they say the worst vice is advice, but I love to give it. So. <laughs> Sounds great. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining and uh, until next time. Thanks for sticking to the end. That means that you're serious about leveling up. If you enjoyed today's episode, please write a review and share the show with your friends. If you're interested in starting your own podcast or guesting on more top rated podcasts, head over to salescast.co-ed to get your free podcast strategy call.